Good morning Hi. and welcome to an online gathering of Windsor Baptist Church and welcome to what would typically have been our junior church celebration service. My name is Julianne and I am the children's worker here at Windsor and this is George and he is my second in command. Hey, Windsor kids would be now full of me. Well, so you think George. But I'm sure most of you this morning, like me, did not expect to be doing church online, mm -mm. never mind still doing it in June. No. But here we are. And as I look back on the last number of months, there have been some really great days, but also some not so great. For some of us, lockdown has brought some tough days, but also in the midst, some really good days. Yeah, like lockdown means I get to spend more time doing adventures. That's right. And that I'm not stuck in the attic. That's right, George. So lockdown has been quite good for George. But as a church family, we have had some cause to celebrate over the last few months with new babies being born. <gasps> babies! I love babies so much. <laughs> That's right. George loves babies. <gasps> we have also watched our new family home at the Majestic near completion. We have saw 1,500 people join together wow. online each Sunday and you may well be joining us this morning for the first time and if so, welcome. But we have also lamented at what has been happening all around the world and we have stood with those who have lost loved ones or who have needed extra support during the crisis. There have been so mm -hmm. many changes and transitions. But this morning we are looking to celebrate. Celebrate and give thanks to God for his goodness in the year that has passed, however unusual that year has been. Uh -huh. We want to say a big thank you to our amazing volunteers who make all things kids and youth possible. And we want to cheer on those who are making big transitions, whether from nursery into P1, P7 into big school or beyond. But one fun aspect of the kids programme that has come about since lockdown is the addition of you, George. Me? Yes, you. Oh, Joanne, you're going to make me blush. Aww. But I've been having so much fun. Like, I've learned about Jehoshaphat. Yeah. And Jonah. Uh-huh. And Esther. Uh-huh. And Daniel. Yeah. And um, Ezra. Yeah. And Nehemiah. Like, so many. It's been so good. Yeah, that's right, George. Over the past number of months, we have been finishing off the Old Testament, ready to begin the New Testament in September. Yeah. But a couple of weeks ago, we were sitting at home watching church online when George had a great idea. Oh, yeah. George, will we show them? Yes, please. Take a look at this. Good morning and thanks again to everyone involved in today's service, including George in your appearance. <gasps> And I'm well aware there's a number of people who think I should step aside and let the puppet speak more. The online petition has started, puppet or pastor. Uh, today, I've got an idea. Two -part I have an idea. She has an idea. Let's go. Hello. Hello. I'm going door to door. Will you vote for me, puppet yes. for pastor? No. Yes. What? Oh, I got two out of three. That's not too bad. Hello. Hello, George. Hello. Hi. Will you vote for me? Yes. I've got sweeties. Give me a hand. It's George. Hi! Will you vote for me? Puppet for pasta? Is there any strings attached? Oh, well, I'm not that type of puppet. Bye! Bye. Hello! Hi, George. Hi! Will you vote for me? Puppet Please. for pasta? Puppet for pasta? Uh-huh! Do you know your stuff or are you just a muppet? Uh, hey, that's not very nice! I'm a great puppet. Oh. Hello. Hello. Will you vote for me? Puppet for pasta? Yes, definitely. No. Oh, what? Who said no? Why not? David, David's a good footballer. Can you what? play football? What? Oh, I don't really have my feet to play football. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Will you vote for me? Puppet for pasta? Why should I 
vote for you. Um, Jenna, why should they vote for me? George, can you not think for yourself for once? Ha, that would be a first time ever. Bye. Oh, George, you see when you get an idea in your head, there's no stopping you. So, did I get your vote? Um, I'm not sure having a puppet for pastor is the best idea you've ever had, George. Oh. But anyway, George, back to the programme. So as we move into a time of worship, let me read first from Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. Verse 8 to 9. Yes, Lord, walking in the ways of your laws, we will wait for you. Your name and renown are the desire of our hearts. My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. Most of the songs today are songs used within Windsor Kids and Youth, so they may not be as familiar, but we hope you will find them helpful in lifting our eyes to Jesus, our rock eternal. Yeah. This first song has been particularly relevant in this season of uncertainty and change, and it's called I'm Trusting You. But first, let us pray. Father God, we come before you, giving thanks for the year that has passed. We thank you that we can trust you, our rock eternal. Even when the circumstances around us cause us to fear, we thank you that you never change. Father, we pray that although this is a family service in a different format and in a different location than the norm, that we will still sense your nearness and presence with us in our individual homes this morning. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Let's get on our feet and worship God together at home. We may all be in our separate homes, but we will join together collectively this morning as we sing and even do some actions. Oh, I love doing the actions. Yeah. I just need some help to find me other stick. Where is it? Quick, I'll be fine in here. follow. I'm trusting you, God. You are good. Life will get crazy, wild and amazing. I'm trusting you, God. You are good. I want to live each day like anything can happen. I can hardly wait to see what's next. I want to face this world with wonder and excitement. Face every challenge, every test Wherever you lead me, I'm gonna follow I'm trusting you, God, you are good Life will get crazy, wide and amazing I'm trusting you, God, you are good Wherever you lead me, I'm gonna follow I'm trusting you, God, you are good what an amazing, I'm trusting you, God, you are good. Walk through the valley, high mountains high, wherever we go, Lord, you are good. Can't hold me back, now I'm gonna fly, wherever we go, Lord, you are good. Walk through the valley, high mountains high, wherever we Go, oh Lord, you are good. Can't hold me back now. I'm gonna fly wherever we go. Lord, you are good. I wanna live each day like anything can happen. Can't hardly wait to see what's next. I wanna face this world with wonder and excitement. Face every challenge, every test. Wherever you lead me, I'm gonna follow. I'm trusting you, God, you are good. Life will get crazy, wild and amazing. I'm trusting you, God, you are good. I'm trusting you, God, you are 
are good. I trust in you, God. You are good. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, I'll praise Him, Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam, Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou rushing wind that art so strong ye clouds that sail in heaven along oh praise him alleluia thou rising moon in praise rejoice ye lights of evening find a voice oh praise him Oh, praise Him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Let all things that create a bless. Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. enjoying our family focused service so far. Had this been any other service in Windsor at the end of June we'd be getting our P7s up to the front um, to mark them and celebrate them and actually this Sunday is no different. In a context right now where we've all had to adapt to change and to a new normal, for our P7s change is even more intense and at the forefront of their thoughts. So what we want to do now is just to pause and celebrate them and pray for them and welcome them into the youth at Windsor. Um, we couldn't do that without seeing all their faces, so here they are. Hi Junior Church! Hi Junior Church! Hi everyone! Hi guys! <laughs> Hello! Hello! Hello. Our P7s have received an Itch Remove booklet produced by SU to guide them through the changes, choices and challenges that are coming their way. It's very much our hope and our prayer for these young people that when faced with those competing paths of the world's way or God's way, that they will be firmly rooted in Jesus. And in that, as they move to school, they will experience life in all its fullness. The Bible is packed full of stories of really young men and women of faith, living radically different from the world around them, taking a stand and doing incredible things for God. 
We dream and we champion Esther and Anna and Oliver and Benjamin and Lucy and Elijah and Grace and Nia and Joseph to the same. So I'm just going to pray for them now. Um, so yeah, let's pray. Jesus, in the face of this huge shift, and all the changes, choices and challenges that are coming down the road for Esther and Anna and Oliver and Benjamin and Lucy and Elijah and Grace and Nia and Joseph. We want to pray over them your hand of blessing and protection. We know that youth is no barrier to great works in your name and for your kingdom. So I pray that you will raise up Esther and Anna and Oliver and Benjamin and Lucy and Elijah and Grace and Mia and Joseph to be kingdom builders and to tell and show their friends a different story, your story of love and hope and restoration. Jesus, we pray for rootedness, that Esther and Anna and Oliver and Benjamin and Lucy and Elijah and Grace and Mia and Joseph will be rooted in you in your words and truth, and they would withstand any and all obstacles before them this incoming year, daily drawing closer to you. And Jesus, we pray for them as loved and valued members of our church family, that they, as they transition to youth, will feel that same care and community that have been present in junior church, and they will experience deep and genuine fellowship through that growing in their love of you. We pray they will give themselves over to the Holy Spirit's moulding and empowering and that you will draw near to them in this time of change and transition. We pray bless them in your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, my name is Mark. I'm the youth pastor here in Windsor and it is so encouraging to see another small group travel from junior church into youth. And just like I said to the P7s in the Zoom call this morning, we are excited to welcome you. Uh, tonight, Sunday Night Youth, please join us 7pm and then as we get to know you over the coming uh, weeks and months ahead. Our vision is to lead young people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Uh, and so church family, would you join us? Uh, would you take these guys to heart? Would you pray for them? Pray that their faith would flourish in the days ahead. Uh, there's a couple of people we want to give specific thanks for this morning uh, who have played significant roles in the life of Windsor Youth and Kids over many years and are now at that transition point of stepping back or changing roles. And so today we want to honour, we want to say thank you to Nick Roney, to Alison Patterson and to Carolyn Young who have served for many years in parent and toddler. Uh, you guys have had pivotal roles in the lives of so many families over those 20 plus years that you've served in this ministry. Uh, I've witnessed firsthand you guys in action on a Thursday morning and it's immediately evident that God is at work in you and through you. And so we this morning wanna say thank you for all those years of service. We also want to say a big thank you to John Louise Haywood who has served for eight years in transit as point leaders. Uh, you guys have been through two cycles of small groups now. You've just handed off your year 11s uh, today and I've really appreciated, really valued your friendship, your wisdom, your heart over those years as we've journeyed together. Uh, so thank you. Um, Nick, Alison, Carolyn, John Louise, we give God all the glory this morning and we pray that you will take the courage on the road ahead. Before I hand over, let me just give three quick updates about Windsor Kids and Youth as we approach July and August. Uh, the first thing to say is that we're going to pause for summer uh, just to give space to rest, to plan ahead. Uh, there's lots of unknowns at the moment as you're well aware. And so please do pray for us as we meet together as point leaders on Tuesday night uh, to plan a way forward. Secondly, uh, you'll have heard me say this before, that what happens at home is more important than what happens at church. And it sounds like I'm trying to do myself out of a job. Uh, and that's because we believe that faith flourishes best at home. Uh, and so over the summer, we want to 
to release and to give you resources as a family that you can continue to take the lead at home uh, with your kids and young people. And then lastly, Shine. For those who don't know, Shine is our holiday Bible club. It normally happens for a week in the summer uh, in Fane Street Primary School, our local primary school in South Belfast. Uh, and with COVID-19, we're not able to gather as we normally would, but, but we have some good news. Watch this. I kind of like you. That's right, Shine is going online, not just for one week in the summer, but right throughout the summer, every Wednesday. Uh, and so registration opens today. So we're asking you to get the word out. Please share this with family, with friends, with neighbors, on Facebook, wherever. Let's get the message out that Shine is happening this summer online and registration is now open. Uh, please do join us in praying for transformation of lives as the life-giving message of Jesus and his love is broadcast into homes across BT9 and well beyond uh, this summer. This morning we've been thinking about changes and challenges and we're all in a state of transit at the moment, aren't we? We all need help for the changes, wisdom for the choices, peace and guidance for the challenges. And so in a moment, Peter and Lucy and Annie are going to come and pray for three specific groups, uh, our P7s, our Year 11s and 14s, and for our leaders in transition. So let's pray together and then Stephen will come and lead us in worship. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the P7s. I pray that you will help them settle into their new schools next year. I pray that you will help them if they are nervous. I pray that they will get used to public transport to get to and from school. Help them to remember that you are always with them. Amen. Dear God, as this school year comes to a close, I pray for the Year 11s graduating from transit. Please help them to continue to develop and mature in their faith as they move on from the structure of youth ministry. I also pray for the Year 14s as they graduate from Clay. Please be with them as they begin new journeys. For those going to university or taking a gap year or following other paths, please let them know your presence and comfort them amidst the uncertainty the world is currently in. Let them be a shining light for you wherever they may be in the world. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks because your good and your faithful love endures forever. We thank you for all of our students and for bringing them to the end of this virtual school year. We especially bring before you Year 7 pupils who will be starting a new school in September and those in years 11 and 14 who also have an important year ahead. We pray for wisdom for the government and for teachers as schools make their plans for resuming in the autumn. We also pray for everyone who has made important transitions during this lockdown period. We thank you for all of our youth leaders and children's leaders here in Windsor who have been serving the church family from parent and toddler right through to transit and beyond. We ask you to be with those who will be stepping down from serving this year and for wisdom and understanding for those who will be taking on these roles. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
to my B-I-B-L-E And this is what it says to me it Tells me that I'm never ever alone I'm learning how J-E-S-U-S Came down to us and gave his best Without a doubt the best friend you'll ever know uh, God knows exactly what I need So I remember this Let's go! When you ask, He cares When you seek, He's there When you knock, 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 knock God opens up the door When you ask, He cares When you seek, He's there When you knock, 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 knock God opens up the door My B-I-B-L-E And this is what it says to me it Tells me that I'm never ever alone I'm learning how J-E-S-U-S Came down to us and gave his best Without a doubt the best friend you'll ever know uh, God knows exactly what I need So I remember this Let's go! When you ask, He cares. When you seek, He's there. When you knock, 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 God opens up the door. When you ask, He cares. When you seek, He's there. When you knock, 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 God opens up the door. Uh, God knows exactly what I need. So I remember this. Let's go. When you ask, He cares. When you seek, He's there. When you knock, 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 God opens up the door. When you ask, He cares. When you seek, He's there. When you knock, 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 God opens up the door. trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and oh we'll see how great how great is our god
Good morning, and uh, thank you to Mark, and Julianne, and Dan, and George for leading us today. And at this special service of, of marking important transitions and changes, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a massive thanks to all our kids and youth workers, paid and voluntary. To all of you who love and serve, who teach and disciple in various creative and faithful ways throughout the year, thank you. We as a church family appreciate and value your input, your example, and your commitment. And we also want to acknowledge with deep gratitude those who are stepping down after years of dedicated involvement and investment. Thank you. Uh, if you have a Bible near to hand, please turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. A month ago, we started to read this rather obscure and somewhat overlooked and avoided book of the Old Testament. It's short, it's only three chapters, 56 verses, but it's full of intriguing, at times confusing, yet totally fascinating content. So let me very quickly explain where we've got to and what's been going on. Habakkuk is a prophet in the land of Judah, which quite frankly is in a mess. The people of God have lost their way, like seriously gone astray. There's all kinds of crazy, ungodly things going on amongst them. Violence, illegal and illicit activity, destruction and immorality, injustice and division. But the problem for Habakkuk the main issue for him is that God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it, even though Habakkuk has been pleading with God for some time to get involved. And so the book starts with Habakkuk asking God the first of a whole bunch of questions. And here's his first one. How long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Habakkuk doesn't get, cannot comprehend God's apparent lack of concern and intervention. And so in prayer, he very honestly and directly pours out his heart to God. Something all of us should do when we've got how long and why questions. Now, once Habakkuk gets his disappointment and questions off his chest, God replies to him. And this book is in fact a record of the back and forth dialogue that takes place between Habakkuk and God. It's the transcript of the prayerful conversation that ensues. Now, God's first reply to Habakkuk doesn't exactly help the prophet. Because although it turns out that God is going to do something about the problem in Judah and with the people of Judah, what he's going to do makes little or no sense at all to Habakkuk. God is going to hold his people accountable, but how he's going to do it sounds mad. God is going to raise up the Babylonians who are a fierce and ruthless, reckless people. Like if the people of God were bad, this lot were a hundred times worse. And yet God is going to use them to carry out his judgment on the people of Judah. As far as Habakkuk is concerned, God's solution to the problem sounds worse than the problem it solves. Habakkuk is confused. And so the prophet replies to God, he prays again and he asks more questions because he's desperate for additional info and understanding. Now, Habakkuk knows God. He worships God. He passionately believes that God is everlasting, personal, holy, just, faithful, dependable. And as he prays, he affirms all of those truths. But in light of them, he still can't quite fathom. He can't get his head around how a God whose eyes are too pure to look on evil can then turn around and look on the treacherous Babylonians and go quiet when they do terrible things. Never mind propose to use them to accomplish his purposes. It's utterly amazing and totally unbelievable. Although, as we've been saying, 
That's exactly what God said it would be. Habakkuk had been warned by God that the answer to his prayer would blow his mind. And again, that's something we need to be prepared for when we pray. God's answers may surprise us. So Habakkuk has prayed and God has responded. Habakkuk has prayed for a second time and then God replies for a second time and lets Habakkuk in on a revelation. And the revelation is this, that not only are the people of God going to experience judgment, but the Babylonians are also heading for the same sobering experience. They are also going to be held accountable. Divine justice is coming down the tracks towards them as well. But Habakkuk and everyone else is going to have to wait for that to happen at an appointed time and date in the future, which is exactly the way it is and will be with ultimate and inevitable judgment. We're going to have to wait for it, but it will happen. Now, as God explains all this to his prophet, he contrasts two types of people, the proud and the godly, or the proud and the righteous, or the proud and the just. Those who live for themselves, who do their own thing, who are self-centered like the Babylonians, and those who live for God, who trust in him and are faithful to him and obedient to him, who are God-centered like how the people of God are meant to be. And immediately after God contrast these two categories, these two types of people, he then shares some genuinely woeful words with the prophet about the judgment that is coming to the proud Babylonians. And this is where we got to, this is where we arrived at last week in the book and in the dialogue. Now, before we hear and consider God's woeful answers to Habakkuk's questions, there's a real danger at this point. Because as we read this wor these words, we might be tempted to immediately distance ourselves from them, like, like zone out and reckon they've got next to nothing to do with me or with us. Surely these are aimed at and are only specifically relevant to the Babylonians, to that one bitter and twisted group of people who at the end of the day deserved everything they got. Well, although there's an element of truth in that perspective, I also want us to see that these words were in fact first spoken to Habakkuk as part of his oracle to share with the people of God. And therefore, as much as it relates directly to the Babylonians, these woes are also instructive for the people of Judah. They were given to teach the people of God at this time and at all times about how not to live, how not to behave, how not to conduct themselves. Plus, it spells out the consequences if they do choose to live like this, because each of the woes we're going to read has two parts. Part one describes what's wrong. Part two describes what happens if you keep on doing it. So with all of that bringing us up to speed, let's hear, let's read the five woes and see what we can learn, because as we're going to discover, these practices, these lifestyle choices have not gone away in the past 2,600 years. So this is Habakkuk 2 verses 6 to 20. And if you're able and willing, I invite you to join me in standing for the reading of God's word. And as you will see from verse 6, these woes basically mock, ridicule, and make fun of people who live like this. Why? Because to use a technical term, it's blinking foolish. So verse 6. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors surely arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. Because you have plundered many nations, the people who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wine skin till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. 
You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming round to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed human blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Please take your seat. So five woes, which highlight the five ways the Babylonians were living and behaving, plus the five consequences. So five ways people today still choose to live and what is at risk. Here are five ways we have got to avoid at all costs if we're going to be godly, faithful people. Woe one, verses 68, is to do with theft. It's where people take what isn't theirs, steal from others by extortion, fraud, deception. However, this is about obtaining material goods and wealth dishonestly. From nicking a packet of pens from work, to ripping someone off, from overcharging a client to cooking the books, from filling out a dishonest claim form to not declaring all necessary or required information, from charging ridiculous interest on payday loans to illegally downloading material you should pay for, and I could go on and on. The Babylonians plundered people left, right, and center. And the consequence, the judgment is, they are gonna lose everything. The tables are gonna turn. What comes around goes around. The people that they have stolen from are going to rise up and take back everything and then some. See, commandment number eight states, do not steal, period. Woe to those who do in Babylon and woe to those who steal and extort in Belfast. After each woe, I'm going to suggest an alternative, a godly attitude or practice based on the rest of Scripture. So instead of stealing, instead of theft, the people of God should be known as those who share, who give, and who show generosity. Woe number two, verses 9 to 11, is to do with injustice, where people treat others unfairly in order to provide some kind of security for themselves. This is about making sure we're set up, we're sorted, we're rich, and not really that bothered about how we achieve it, who we exploit, take advantage of, or manipulate in order to get there and stay there. The Babylonians committed all kinds of gross injustices so that they could set their nest on high, as it says. In other words, to look down on others from their place, from their position of sinful hoarding, safety, and security. It's the kind of attitude of, I'm all right, Jack, and as long as I'm okay, I don't care about those beneath me. And the consequences of this mentality, the judgment on this behavior, is that those who pursue it will ultimately forfeit their life, to quote verse 10. Or to put it in Jesus' terms, they may gain the whole world, but they will lose their very soul. Woe to those who treat others unfairly. It still happens. It's still a risk. The alternative? The godly position and attitude is to be a person of integrity and justice. Woe number three, verses 12 to 14, is to do with violence and murder, where people will go to extreme lengths to build empires, fame and recognition, gain recognition. It's an anything goes mindset where people will do what it takes and anything it takes to pursue their own agendas, even if it means people get hurt in the process or blood is spilt. The Babylonians were a violent and a bloodthirsty people and anyone who stood in their way got taken out, got removed. But the consequences of this, the judgment on this behavior is stark because it says all their efforts will come to nothing, to zero. They may think they are a powerful people who can do what they want and literally plunge in their way to fame and glory. But as verse 14 says, and again, this is another one of those verses in Habakkuk that sounds similar, 
to something we read elsewhere in Scripture. But as the waters cover the sea, so the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Woe to those who take life, who shed blood, and who seek their own glory. The alternative is that we need to be a people of compassion who seek to glorify God in all we do. Woe number four, verses 15 to 17, is to do with exploitation, where people take advantage of others in order to gain pleasure for themselves. The Babylonians got people drunk in order to make them do things they wouldn't or mightn't otherwise do. They got them drunk in order to quote verse 15, in order to gaze on their nakedness, which is understood to be an implicit way of saying in order to take sexual advantage of them. Now listen, I'm not gonna go into any great graphic detail here, but the exploitation of people and specifically the sexual exploitation of people through pornography and date rape drugs and prostitution and sex slavery, it is still a reality. It is still rampant in our world and our society. The Babylonians were known for it. But the consequence, according to verse 16, is shame and disgrace, which is often the upshot of those who get exposed for this kind of behavior. But in addition, the judgment for the exploitation, the sexual exploitation of people is judgment itself. In in verse 16, we read that the cup in the Lord's right hand was coming round to them. And they were going to have to drink from that particular cup, which is the cup of judgment. They had forced others to drink. Someday it would be their turn to drink under duress. Listen to these sobering, excuse the pun, words from Psalm 75. It is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Woe to those who exploit others for their own pleasure. The alternative, the godly position, is to love, respect, and put others first. Finally, woe number five, verses 18 to 20, is to do with idolatry, where people set up something in God's rightful place and place their trust in it and worship it. The Babylonians were idolaters through and through. They not only made and shaped idols from wood and stone, we also read in chapter one how Habakkuk made the point that their strength was their God. Plus, he also commented on how they sacrificed to their nets and burned incense to their drag nets. See, an idol is anything that solicits our affection and devotion in front of God. In broad terms, it is anything that replaces love for the creator with anything he has given as a gift. Idolatry is at root misordered love. It's love for the created before or rather than the creator. For us, we need to make sure that we see the whole of life, our finances, our relationships, our food, our leisure, our clothes, our work, our family, not as gods, but as gifts. The minute we put any of those in front of God, we have made an idol. The Babylonians had numerous things in God's place. And the consequence, the judgment, was that they were going to end up deceived and disappointed because, as verse 19 makes clear, there is absolutely no life in an idol. There's no breath in it at all. They will never take God's rightful place. Woe to those who have them. Commandments 1 and 2. Do not worship any God except me and do not make an idol. You see, the alternative is to be a people who, to quote Jesus again, worship and serve the Lord only. So there are the five woes of Habakkuk 2, or of God, directed towards the Babylonians that spelt out the five things, the five areas where they were messing up, where they were getting it wrong, and what was going to happen to them as a result of their behavior. But as I said earlier, don't be tempted to file these away under the category of vaguely interesting, but not exactly applicable. Instead, Allow them to instruct and teach, to warn and witness about the dangers of pride, the dangers of living my way as opposed to God's way. Plus, let them teach us the importance of godly living, of trusting in and being faithful to and obedient to God. And so I want to finish with the last verse of Habakkuk chapter 2, which is in fact still part of the fifth woe. As it says, idols have no life in them. 
wherever they are placed. But God, this is what this verse teaches, God is alive and well and located in his holy temple. He is enthroned in heaven. Idols are lifeless, whereas God is presently and eternally active. The contrast is striking. And all of this, all of what Habakkuk has just been told, and all of what we have discovered is meant to leave him and everyone who hears it speechless, literally. And therefore, the instruction, the final command of God is simple yet profound. Let all the earth keep silence before the Lord. The, the appropriate response to the holiness and justice of God is silent awe and tight-lipped wonder. The right, the proper reaction to God's impending, coming, and inevitable judgment is reverential quietness. A silence that stills the self before the awesome power and majesty of God. This is another divine call like the one we find in Psalm 46, to be still and know, to stop speaking for a while, to stop rushing around to unplug and to discipline the mind and the body to focused silence, to quiet reflection and contemplation. Silence is, has been, and always will be a spiritual discipline of the first order, where on a regular basis we shut down and shut out the constant noise and distraction of surrounding sounds and become increasingly attentive to God. We live in a busy, noisy world and most of us have an aversion to quiet or at least we find it uncomfortable and awkward and therefore if we're going to practice this discipline if we're going to obey this command of God to Habakkuk and all the earth then we need to be intentional we need to choose to do this we need to create time and space to occupy this silent place and so as I close this morning here's my one suggestion for you to take away no questions just one suggestion Challenge yourself to spend two hours in silence with God and before God and before next Sunday. Consider God's woeful answers to Habakkuk, all five of them. Reflect on the presence of theft, injustice, violence, exploitation and idolatry in our world, and maybe even in our lives. Take your journal or a piece of paper if you don't use one and write down the thoughts and the insights that come to mind and use those as fuel for prayer. So Habakkuk has spoken. He has prayed twice. God has replied twice. Now it's Habakkuk's turn again. What's he going to say in response this time? Well, that's next week. May all the earth keep silence before the judge of all the earth, who always does what's right. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We are more, more, more than conquerors through Him who loved us, through Him who loved us. We are more, more, more than conquerors through Him who loved us, through Him who loved us. What can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? What can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing, 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 nothing. We are more, more, more than conquerors through Him who loves, through Him who loves us. We are more, more. Separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus.
Jesus. What can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? What can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Nothing, nothing. Separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. What can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Nothing, nothing. online this morning but George has disappeared on me no where is here it? I come here I come you are. oh I'm just getting the church barbecue fired up we always have one in June but the tongs got stuck on me oh let me help you here oh, George oh, oh, oh thank you so much that's right George but how are you going to manage a virtual barbecue oh I never thought of it oh, silly oh well 200 burgers just for me oh, <laughs> Anyway, before I close in prayer this morning, can I just remind you of a few things? So George is going to be taking a little break over summer, yeah. 
but we will still have great resources for our kids and tots every single Sunday yeah. that you can access on the web page. So this summer we are going to be diving in to the life of Peter as we look at what it means to follow Jesus. We have also created a Sermon Notes Kids Edition page that can be printed and used during the church service over the summer months yeah. and this will be provided via the web page. And of course, don't forget to register for Shine 2020 and spread the word. It's going to be great. Yeah. But let us pray. Father God, we have come to the end of our worship service this morning and we want to give you thanks for being present with us together apart. We thank you for the songs that have been sung, the people who have participated and the word that has been spoken. Be with us as we head into our individual weeks and be with those who are heading towards big life transitions in the coming weeks and months. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.